We're gonna get all the angles of my room right now, all of them. <laughs> I've been meaning to do this video for a while and I've been dragging it as long as I could just because it's uh, something I've never done before, something that is very dark. Anyway, welcome to my chatty time. And this week we're gonna talk about the dark side of Johnny's and Associates. More exactly, or the dark side of Johnny Kitagawa. Again, a disclaimer before we start, I have pages of notes right there that I've been gathering for uh, quite uh, quite some time. So I've done my best to get like the most accurate information. I wasn't here, I'm not making any, any accusation. This, this is not aiming to, to make any company or any person look bad. This is the reason why I will refer to most of the facts as allegations because I don't want anybody to sue me right now, okay? Also, I will make this video entirely in English just because uh, most of my findings were in English so it would be easier for me to relate uh, what I found and just give my opinion and my uh, personal uh, view of the things that I read. Of course, if you are interested in doing the subtitles, you can do so with the community subtitles, so please do so. I love you. Thank you very much. Let's start. <laughs> so in my presentation, what is Johnny Kitagawa? I mentioned briefly some allegations that were made against Johnny and some members of the group Four Leaves. This put into light a lot of things that were going wrong with the agency, like inside and out, meaning the influence they have uh, outside in the media, but also the way it was managed and the way the talents were handled. So what really happened? Behind the scenes of the way the talents were handled comes to light all the pedophilia allegation. So the first point that was really addressing this was the book released by one member of Olive called Kitakoji and the title was the book was to Hikaru Genji. Hikaru Genji was the group that debuted after Foley so this book was basically a letter talking to the new group about what happened to Four Leaves so so they would be prepared what might happen to them in the future. So this book was really relating the relationship between the talents and Johnny's and put into light in very graphic manners because I've read some passage of, uh, of the books. I didn't manage to find the book uh, online, obviously it's already too late and I believe it was banished right now. Back in the days, basically the talent were just sharing a dormitory and they were sharing the dormitory with Johnny. And this is where things happen. So this book was like what sparked the pedophilia allegation because obviously the talents were either very young or underage at the time and they were under the responsibility of Johnny and the book basically said that all the encounters that happened could have also an impact on how the talents were handled. But that's not when the court case happened. The next year in 1989 another written piece were released by one of the former Johnny's talent called Nakatani Ryo and this related exactly the same type of thing. So it was still about like the encounters of Johnny taking advantage of his position into the agency and the contract that he had with the talent to make sexual advances to the talent and get what he wanted from them. Almost 10 years later, a magazine called Shunkan Bunshun did a 10 part series where they were publishing stories about how the talents were handled and it was covering a lot of different things. It was covering the fact that the talent were like drinking and smoking, also addressing the, the sexual advances uh, allegation that we mentioned before and that was in, and that were in line with what Kitakoji said previously in his book. Johnny sued, obviously, the magazine saying that this was only defamation, that they didn't have any grounds and uh, they were just trying to ruin the reputation of the agency. This fight between the magazine and the agency was covered internationally. Like nationally that was a big thing, internationally it got also picked up. That was like in the, in the 90s as well. So probably most of us in the fandom never heard about it because obviously at the time we didn't have access to that. Again, this is what I found online, don't come for me. So this all happened in the year 1999. Just a few years before that, in 1996, another book from another former Johnny's talent, Junya Hiramoto, and this one was called All About Johnny's, relating all the same problems, all the same abuse that happened backstage. The title sounded a bit catchier, a bit more scandalous. It didn't have the same impact as Kitakoji because Kitakoji was really the one to first put into light what really happened. And it had a bit more ground into the court case of 1999, but obviously it means that it was not the only isolated incident and there were several of them. So obviously the agency first sued the magazine and in 2002 the agency actually won the lawsuit. The magazine made an appeal to that and the next year in 2003 they actually won the appeal. Now this is what I found. There were mostly 10 points and half of these points were proven uh, true. Let me read uh, the statements. So the statements that were published by the magazine and that were debated into court are the following. So the first one. If the boys refuse his advances, Mr. Kitagawa would place them in a bad position on stage, in the corner, out of the limelight, or refuse to allow them to appear on television altogether. I'm reading, okay. Having created a situation where it was impossible for them to refuse, he could and did sexually harass them. Two, the plaintiff, Mr. Kitagawa, let the minors drink alcohol and smoke on a daily basis in his dormitory. Three, 
when the underage pop group Junior 4 were taken into custody for shoplifting, Johnny's Jimu Show conspired with affiliated TV networks to put a lead on the story and keep it from being reported. This also happened with other similar incidents. 4. The plaintiff, and in particular the Jimu Show office managers, singled out the member of the Four Leaves pop group for abuse and mistreatment. Four Leaves, for reminder, is the group in which Kitakoji was a member. 5. Adult talent, which had previously worked for Johnny's, were treated coldly for long periods of time. 6. The underage boys were given such busy show business schedules that they were unable to attend school. 7. The talent employed by the Jimu Show were routinely not paid money owed to them. 8. The Jimu Show affiliated fan clubs were managed in such a way that they ignored the fans. That make me chuckle because... <laughs> yes. And 9. The mass media is scared of Johnny's Jimu Show and only prints flattering things about them. Out of these nine claims, the courts found that two, three, four and five were defamatory. So that means they let uh, the miners drink alcohol and smoke on a daily basis, defamatory, that they tried to cover up when, the, when Junior 4 was caught for shoplifting. This was uh, defamatory. There was mistreatment, mistreatment of the, of the four-leaf groups. And five, that the former members were treated coldly after a long period of time. So these were not proven true and accurate, so it was rejected. However, and this is where it gets dark, they found that one, six, seven, eight, and nine were supported by the evidence. And, which is, and this is the reason why the appeal was granted. To sum up, meaning the repeat sexual abuse, failure to pay, to pay wages, heartless treatment of artists, the reliction of responsibility to raise minors in his care, systematic ignoring of fans and the intimidation of mass media were found to be true. There were always the assumption that the agency was too powerful and had very close ties to either politicians or maybe allegedly the mafia and use this influence to only get uh, a positive image, the talents or the agency, into all the media. We all know that the image is strictly controlled already and the talent didn't have access to any type of platform to make sure that everything is kept into order under what Johnny wanted for the talents and for the agency. So the image would be preserved this way. But the fact that they would use this to only get flattering review and get maybe higher rankings or maybe favors into the medias and that the media was scared of saying anything bad because there would be repercussion for them. This is going a bit a bit beyond what we could assume. And this apparently was proven supported by evidence. More importantly, it means that all the pedophilia allegations were also proven by the court to be true. But because it was the, an appeal of the magazine against the case that was won by Johnny's, I'm assuming this is why there were no action taken against Kitagawa at the time. It just means that the magazine were, it, were right about this and they didn't have to erase, delete the content that they published or made an apology or anything like that because this was proven to be true. It was not like one of the victims was actually suing him for the action that he has done. So this is why I think people were wondering if this is proven true, why wasn't the guy put in jail? I think this is the reason why. That was never the, the subject of the case. The subject was, the magazine is defamatory, I want them to delete everything. Appeal, not all of it is defamatory so they can keep this content published. This is again my understanding, okay? It was said that around 2009, the dormitory system was changed. Like, so Johnny was no longer sharing the dormitory with the, um, with the talent and it was not like living with them or whatever. Bear in mind that the appeal was won in 2003 and the system was changed in 2009. So we can assume that the, the previous abuse stopped in 2009, but we don't know what happened during this period of time between 2003 and 2009. We don't know if, they, if this happened afterwards as well because no the victim were, were talking or there was no the accusation actually made public about it. So we don't know if this continue or if this stopped at the time. But this case still raises a few issues in my opinion. The first one being, this was related nationally. It was proven that this man ran an agency and was abusing his talent. However, it never stopped the agency from getting new talent. So as a parent, how is it possible that you see this on television and still go to get your child to be enrolled into the agency. How can the family still trust the agency or the man that is running the agency and not protecting their own children? That's what I really don't understand. The second point, the power and the control of the mass media, this is something that is not specific to Johnny's in my opinion. I think all of the powerful agency actually have this kind of position by making negotiations or deals with people that are higher up and granting them favors that might not be very legal or might not be very ethical. 
this is something that is very specific to the industry and it's not something that everybody talks about but it's been a reality and a lot of talents are not talking about it i'm thinking more in the in terms of the k-pop industry a lot of former talents are now opening their own YouTube channel, relating their own experience about it, talking about it. And this is how the public is making made aware of what is happening backstage. It's not just like all sparkle and shine and you're a superstar. And part of this abuse can be the, the sexual abuse by the manager, but it can also be like harassment, mental, mental harassment, or uh, just like selling the talents to like investors and things like that. No longer treating people as humans with rights, but just as a property that you own and this is why I wanted to make this video to talk about it to open a conversation about it because secretly we all know it it is so taboo that we don't want to talk about it because we do believe that it has nothing to do with us or just because we can't do anything about it we shouldn't be addressing it all of this is covering the dark side of the industry in itself of how idols are perceived and used by the agency usually they are the one targeted but the agency is still fine the people in, into power are still fine and living the life and just you know we can just sacrifice one we can get 10 others and this is not very gender specific because i do believe that this is the same for male idols and female idols all around the world it's not specific to asia it's not specific to japan it also happens a lot with the in america and things like that and if you look around you can just see that it's exactly the same type of things what idols have been talking a lot more now is uh, slave contracts and that's exactly it sometimes they will just blackmail them to get what they want from them and this is under under contract which is fucked up <laughs> it's so fucked up and in terms of what happened with Johnny we don't know if the cycle has been broken or not I do believe that part of counter effect of the of the process is the fact that now every time any of the talent is uh, spotted smoking drinking uh, having uh, like uh, sexual affairs with uh, with one of people they suspend them right away they don't really take any responsibility for it they're just like oh this is the, the talent's fault we're just putting them on the side end of the discussion it's very difficult to humanize the, the artist when the agency is not doing that. All in all, I do believe that there are things that we don't know. Will there be more testimony coming to life? Or can we just assume that all the talent don't want to talk about it anymore because he passed away? It's very difficult to know and we might never know. One thing that makes me wonder if the abuse still continued on a regular basis is the fact that there were no other testimonies. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Maybe they were just scared that nothing would be taken seriously after what happened to Kitakoji and to the authors and to the, the, the court case because no actions were really taken. And I think it's even more difficult when it's men and men because there are a lot of issues with the LGBT community and the fact that they don't want to acknowledge it and they don't want to talk about it and they can still be like mistreated or even abused just because they are, they are gay if they are. This is for me putting into light a lot of different issues and a lot of different discussions that should be open. So whatever your view or your belief on the agency, I think we should really focus on what is at stake and what should be changed. For me, we are all responsible at, to some extent in the sense that we are the end client. So we, as fans, as consumer, we make the numbers. And the numbers in terms of ratings, in terms of uh, money, in terms of uh, what makes a success for a um, TV show or the success of a magazine, a publication, and therefore keep the position of power into the industry. Which, when you think about it, is a big fact up because we are making this happen, <laughs> kind of. So by providing the money, the affluence, by providing the ratings, it means that we, as a end client, if I can say so, we kind of allow the monsters to lay with the land. So now that the molester is gone, if I can say so, it means that now is the, is the time to people to talk about it. And what I didn't really like to see online is just people saying making accusation and pushing views and telling people how they should feel and how they should react you can only be responsible about your own feelings and your own views but you can't really judge how other people are feeling or how they should be reacting to a situation or to a person because again there are a lot of things that we don't know because we were not part of this. We were not, we were not even into the history of what happened. The only people who would be able to talk about it are the people actually involved, so the talents themselves. And I feel it's a bit 
hypocritical to make such a strong judgment on other people when we are kind of partly responsible. So the aim of this video is just to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of uh, food for thought, if I can say so. The aim is not to point fingers, the aim is not to take a side or make accusation. The aim for me is just to open a situation and just think ourselves, what can we do now? Because we don't want to punish the talents, right? We don't want them to be punished or break the stage or just like make everything go down because obviously they are the ones that we want to support. So at the end of the day, I'm asking you, what do we do? There you go. <laughs> I'm so sorry if this video was a bit too heavy or too dark. At what point you just have to roll the camera, talk and just like share it. If this goes bad enough, I will just delete it. But uh, at least I hope it gives you uh, more of an overview of what people have been talking about. Hopefully make uh, people have a discussion, like a productive discussion. Uh, let me know in the comment um, what you thought about it. And uh, remember to give this video a thumbs up and, a, and a share it if you enjoyed it. If you missed last week's video, I will put it right here. So don't forget to watch it and let me know your thoughts. And if not done yet, remember to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss next week's video. That's it for me this week. I'll see you very soon. Bye bye! Back where?